Hello and welcome to Tash Talks, the show where we meet some of the UK's leading female entrepreneurs. My guest today is somebody you're all going to love hearing from. She's the founder of two brands which every woman in the UK will know, and those are Rodial and Nip and Fab. I'm thrilled to introduce Maria Hatsi Stefanis. Welcome, Maria. I am so excited to have you here. Of literally all the guests this season, I was really excited to have you. So start by telling everyone, who is Maria Hatsi Stefanis? So I am Maria Hatsi Stefanis. I'm the founder of the Rodial Group, Rodial and Ibn Fab. Uh, I have been in business for 24 years now, and I'm so excited to be here. Oh, amazing. So you have founded two iconic brands, as you just said, no Rodial and Nip and Fab. To me, to our viewers, they both seem like huge brands, huge successes, that they've been around, they're part of the fabric of Britain. Like, but where did it all start? So I studied uh, back in Greece, where I'm from, English literature, uh, but I wasn't really into it. So while I was at uni, I took a part-time job doing some beauty writing for Seventeen magazine. Uh, I did that for a little bit. I graduated. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I was intrigued by business, so I moved to New York. I studied business. I graduate. I still don't know what I want to do with my life. And um, I decided, you know, business is interesting. I got an offer to work in banking. And I took that offer, came to London with work. I uh, worked for a couple of years. At the beginning, very excited, but then into the two years, I was becoming a very bad employee. So one day I was called into the boardroom and I got fired. Maria, this is impossible to imagine you were being a bad employee. I can't, what were you doing? Uh, you know, I was, there was a culture of you have to work 24 seven and I was going late, leaving early and not working on the weekends and just generally losing interest. Okay. So. Um, that was the worst thing that happened to me. I was in my early 20s, that was my first job, and suddenly I had no job. But what made me realize is I need to be in a career path where I'm passionate about the product. And um, after researching and traveling and trying to figure out what I want to do with my life, I decided to start a beauty brand, and that's when I decided to start Rodial. And where did you start with a brand like Rodeo? It's, it's so difficult to imagine back then what happened. You started from your house, didn't you? Where did you start? How did you start? Yes, it was uh, quite um, a grueling process because right now you have Google, you can Google everything, you can find all the resources that you need. But back in the day, we didn't have all this plethora of information. So the first thing I did, I started going to all those trade shows. Cosmoprof is, is a big one. Um, and I went to Italy with a carry-on bag and went from stand to stand meeting um, product manufacturers, meeting labs, packaging companies, and, and filling it up up with leaflets. Came back to London, um, sorted out and then started calling people and making appointments to go and sit down and figure out what are the resources that I needed to start my brand. Um, so I started very small. I uh, tried to get investment. I didn't get investment back in the day. And so I said, you know what, I'll start super small from a back room at home so I don't have to pay rent or get employees. And I literally had this tiny office it was me. My first production was 500 pieces, four SKUs in the cupboard, and that's how Rodial started. And how did you get bring it to market from having those products back in those early days? Um, so back in the day, we didn't have e-commerce, uh, D2C, as it's um, uh, now known. Now known. Yeah. Um, so I had to find a store to sell my products. Uh, there were obviously all the usual suspects from Harvey Nichols, Harrod, Space and K, they were all around, but I wanted to start a little bit smaller. So um, I started with Phoenix, uh, which is used to be a store yeah. uh, in Bond Street. Yeah. Um, I went there with a bag, good bag of products, um, knocked the door, there was the buyer there, and I said, I'm Maria, I'm the founder of Rodial, I want to show you my products. So she said, you have five minutes, we sat down, I showed her my products. And she said, oh, well, you know, it sounds interesting. I want to give you a chance. I'm going to give you a shelf of this size. We can put your products in. 
with one condition. I'm like, what's the condition? You will have to come and sell your products. Um, so during the week, Monday to Friday, I was at my back office at home running the business. And Saturday, Sundays, I would go to the store, Phoenix, and sell. So that's how it all started, super small. I needed to make sure my products sold. So I put all my energy into having a successful first six months. It worked really well. So the minute we hit the six month uh, mark, they gave us more space and that's how we started growing. And when you look back on that, that must have been such an important period. I think there's nothing better than standing with your products, although it's hard in front of the people who are possibly going to buy them and having that one-to-one -one interaction. Did that help you develop the range at the time? It really helped me with everything I did for the business to start at the very bottom. Um, understanding the customer, knowing what they want, knowing what they like, knowing what they dislike. So it really helped me understand and fine tune who the Rodial woman is. And this is something that continuously we do every year. We sit down, we do a big brainstorming with the team and we define who is the Rodial woman, what does she want. Um, and I think that the core of the success of a beauty brand or any brand is really understand your customer and spending that time on the shop floor yeah. was super Super important. Even now, yesterday I was in, um, I was doing store visits and Selfridges and Harrods, and I do love that connection and being with the customers, speaking with our teams. Uh, I feel it's super important if you want to do well in any business to really understand your end customer. So over the past 24 years, the beauty industry has changed so much and grown so much. I think there's never been more products on the market than there are today. Rodial has absolutely stood the test of time. How have you managed to do that? It's been a journey and uh, we've been through a lot of highs and lows and we've been through a lot of recessions. So we've been through the 2008 recession and I feel as a new brand, when you first go tough times in the economy that are beyond your control, you're thinking, oh my God, this is the end. But I find with experience and having gone through a lot of highs and lows over the years, I kind of say to myself, it's going to be okay. Just, you know, hold in there and things will get better. Um, you know, even when we had COVID, for, for us it was devastating because our business has historically been a wholesale model. Yes. Yeah. So the core of our business is selling to the stores and the online piece was extremely small. So suddenly all the stores close. We have nowhere to sell our products. So we had to quickly adjust and move everything online. And it ended up being one of our best years. So I always say that when you have challenges, whether it's um, micro challenges within the business or micro challenges of the economy, this is the opportunity to adjust, to change. And some of the best decisions that I have taken personally as a business person are through tough times. Now, before we come on to talking more about some of those tough times, just tell us about the second brand you launched, Nip and Fab, which came along sometime, sometime later, but it's another hugely popular brand. So there was a time that um, the trend of designer brands in the high street started rolling out. So there was um, Karl Lagerfeld for H&M and Stella McCartney for Gap. And I'm seeing all these amazing brands going through um, mass distribution channels through a diffusion range. So that's how Nip and Fab started. It was going to be a diffusion range from Rodial that we can distribute to channels like Boots and Superdrug and, and, and more affordable prices, but products that do have some of the DNA of Rodial. So that's how it all started. But then over the years, Nip and Fab has developed its own DNA, a very different customer base. Mm -hmm. And right now it still belongs to our group, but it's run by a different business because it's become such a brand of its own. So now the brands are super separate, uh, but obviously, you know, I'm super proud of having started as a diffusion range and now it's become Because it really bigger. does stand on its own TV. I mean, it's an, I always think it's an incredible brand and it's been great to meet some of your team as well from Nip and Fab who are fantastic. Oh, they're fantastic. And a lot of people don't know that we own both brands, but also I'm mainly representing Rodial yeah. just because you can't do everything in this world. Um, but I'm proud of both. So let's talk about the concept of not being able to do everything. How? What are some of your greatest moments and also some of the challenges that you've overcome along the way? Um, some of the challenges for me have been um, 
learning along the way. I feel a lot of people think that you start your own business or you have it all figured out from day one. And the reality is I just, I started, I made a lot of mistakes along the way. For example, at the beginning, um, the carton um, suppliers that I found, I went for the cheapest code because obviously I wanted to save on costs. The cartons arrive, they are the wrong size, the products don't fit. I don't know who made the mistake, the packaging designer, the carton company. Um, and I remember being devastated because we had to reprint the carton. So, um, you know, that taught me it's not necessarily the least expensive quote. You have to check other things around um, mm -hmm. your supplier. So, you know, small things like that that happened at the beginning that I was devastated and it was a big expense for me back in the day. But I feel when you are in business, no one can teach you everything or you don't know everything from day one you learn along the way and you become better so a lot of challenges along the way and and a lot of high moments and i don't think there was necessarily one high moment um, it's launching to a new chain of stores or getting a great piece of press or um having um you know i have team members that i've seen starting from starting at a reception and now running a department and yeah. and seeing that I was able to offer people not just a job, but a career. So there's so many things over the years that you have to find positive and highs every single day to say, you know, so you, so you can feel energized about your business. And I think one of the things that you personally became, or for, in my recollection, really propelled you into the public spotlight um, outside of the brand's profile was your first book, How to Be an Overnight Success which is all about how to be an overnight success. So tell me, how, how is one an overnight success? So the book is um, interesting. A lot of people ask me, why did you write a book? Yeah. Um, so as you know, I'm very active on Instagram and I, was, I, I post a lot of motivational quotes and I was getting a lot of messages. I want to start my business. Can you give me advice? Or I've started this business and six months later, it's not going anywhere. I'm ready to quit. You know, what would you advise? And I just saw there's so many amazing young entrepreneurs out there that want to start a business, grow a business, and they get very disheartened mm -hmm. if they don't succeed immediately. And it, by that point, before I wrote the book, I was working on Growing Rodial for 18 years and people just discovered me and I thought that was an overnight success. So um, the name of the book, the title is Ironic, How to Be an Overnight Success. On the first page, I bust that myth, you cannot be an overnight success. It took me 18 years to be where I, where I am now. And through the book, I go through all the challenges that I faced, how I overcame them in order to give um, hope to everyone who is struggling right now with their business and make sure I share some of the tools that I've used to get me where I am today. So you can be a success. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of hard work but it cannot happen overnight. Do you think, because it's such an interesting topic, and I really feel in the last few years we've been living through an era in which the concept of overnight success has just become more and more sort of popularised by social media and a few outlier stories of people or brands who've done incredibly well. That's not the reality for most people. Why do you think people hang on so much to their only a success if they're an overnight success versus a longer journey, the more, reali you know, the more realistic journey? I think it has to do with a lot of people not being honest about their journey. Um, I was at this conference and there was this uh, very popular and well-known YouTuber yeah. uh, who I, I know they've been working for a good 15 years by that point to develop their brand. And they got a question from the audience saying, so how did you get there? How can we be as successful as you on YouTube? And, um, and she responded, well, it just takes a lot of hard work and passion. And I just felt, you know, this is not an honest answer. Uh, because a lot of people work hard. A lot yeah. of people have passion. Yeah. But it's more than that. It's about consistency. It's about waking up every morning, not feeling it. But it's, I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to put some work, I'm going to put whatever I can today, and hopefully the day after I'm going to feel better, I'm going to be more energized. Um, and I do feel a lot of people just gloss over any challenges they have in their journey. And that's why we get this view that um, 
unless you succeed quickly and easily, you're a failure. So it's, I think it's the messages that circulate around. And how did it land? How did that book land with people? What was the feedback you got when people read it and then realized that you were 18 years into your point? They must have been 18 years into your journey. They must have been relieved. Um, it, it's uh, it's amazing the feedback that I got uh, from whether it's from young people who start the business or from um, even you know retired um, men and women who just suddenly they're thinking oh this is the time for me I'm going to start my own business or people outside the business industry who felt um, motivated suddenly to achieve something with their lives. I still get DMs and messages on how the book had changed a lot of people's mm-hmm. lives and giving them that motivation and energy. And a lot of people are surprised about how honest I am uh, with some of the challenges that I've had. And I've been very open about it in my first book, how I got fired. In my second book, how I almost went bankrupt. And in my third book, how I had a mental breakdown and how I dealt with it. So there's always, in all my three books, it starts with a big drama. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and so I feel like they're, they've been like psychotherapy. Yeah. And suddenly, perhaps I haven't admitted to the world that I was fired before launching my book and then all the world knows. So it's sort of, I've, op- I've opened up, I have nothing to hide. And that really resonates with um, the readers. And over the years you've had radio, one thing you're, I think you're quite well, industry you're quite well, in the industry you're quite well known for is not having always run the brand privately, not having had investment into the brand. We live into an era, in an era, particularly over the last five years, where so many brands have investment and have so much money poured into them to help them be successful. What's your view on that? Why you haven't, why you haven't taken investment? Why you prefer not to? Over the years, we were offered investment and I have pursued investment, but we're still 24 years later, still a private company without any external investment. But I remember it was around year three. Um, We were just about doing our first sales and having a bit of traction, just launched in the US. And I had a, a private angel investor come to me and say, I value your business at 1 million and I'm happy to invest £250,000 for 25% of the business. And I was so excited. You know, when you're just starting out, you hear a million, it is the valuation, it is a big deal. And £250,000 would be a year's budget. So I was so excited. And then we started talking and it looked like what I wanted for Brodial for the brand was to grow the brand, elevate it, get it in the right places. And, and, I had a vision for the brand, but the angel investor's vision was more about let's just get it in as many stores as we can. So we'll have to make some compromises on the distribution channel, make it look like a brand that wasn't really my vision. So based on that, I decided not to proceed with the investment. And now I would have given away 25% of my business for £250,000. So I, honestly, in hindsight, I'm glad I didn't do it. And you still get approached by investors now? Um, Yeah, there's still uh, investors that are knocking on our door and um, I find that, you know, the best time to get investment is when you don't need it. I feel a lot of companies go and get investment where they're desperate for money and then you get in just anyone, um, you compromise the brand. And I've seen so many founders have to exit their businesses after they get into bed with investors that are not right for them. Um, And so for the time being, I'm still excited to run the business. Rodial is my baby. And I feel that as long as I am excited to turn up, I, I don't need to sell any piece of the business. If in the future something changes or if the right partner comes along, I may consider it. But for the time being, we're still private. And I know when people ask you for advice, and some of them might ask you for advice around investment or growing their brand, you've often talked about how you can grow things sustainably. Because I feel in we've moved into an era where a lot of people think they can't even start their brand without investment. Now, obviously, there's many different ways in which you can start a brand. There's a low-cost way and a high-cost way. But how have you found the benefits of you know, using your profits to grow the brand and doing that sustainably? albeit 
over not a three-year time period or a five-year time period, over a longer time period? That is a very good point. I think you, you can start your own business or you can get investment. Um, when you do it your own way, it definitely takes a bit longer. But for me, there's two benefits to doing it directly. One is that um, everything you spend has to give you a return on investment. So I know a lot of small brands that get investment and they suddenly invest in luxurious offices and a lot of staff that, oh, we get all this stuff to scale the business, but before they're ready. And in effect, you're just wasting money before you know what you need to do. Um, the other reason is I feel that, at least with my journey, going through every single area of the business personally, from selling on the floor, from being involved with operations and the factories, from uh, doing the e-commerce side and customer services and doing PR, marketing. I've done everything. So I feel that I'm a more well-rounded entrepreneur for that reason. Um, I know cases where a fund goes in, buys a lot of the company, and then immediately the founder is pushed aside and it's just doing one specific thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel mm -hmm. very fortunate that I've experienced everything just because I had no other choice. And actually, that's one thing your team always say about you is because, you know, I think from the outside looking in, it looks like you lead a very glamorous life. You're obviously doing Dragon's Den in Greece. You're very well known in Greece. But if you ask any of your team about you, they say, oh, no, she's properly like doing the work. She's properly grafting, which I think is an incredible accolade, really. I certainly think your team really respect that. Um, the team is everything. And um, I, from from day one, it's building the right team. It's yeah. It's a key it's a key point for me. Um, hiring the right people that may or may not be the best on paper, but for me, it's all about the energy. It's about we all have the same vision. We all are passionate about what we do. And that if you have, if you and your team have the same vision and passion, then the tough days, you're going to get through them much lighter as opposed to having a team you know, who looks amazing on paper, but they don't really care. They're there for a job and a paycheck and yeah, they move yeah. on. So I feel that, and that's one of the um, elements that I'm very proud of my team. I have a lot of people who've been with me over 10 years yeah. and I do count on them and I depend on them. And it, I, I feel they're like family. Now on Tash Talks, we always only talk to women, which invariably means the topic comes up of the juggle, motherhood, how to do it. You've got two boys who are now quite grown up. How have you managed that over the years? Um, so I first started the business and then had the boys, which means that there was already a background of a business that I was committed to. And then having kids, it, my view was they would have to fit in the schedule of the work, uh, which I know it's it's not a, a very, um, you know. I mean, I've a, had the same view with yeah, my kids, to be honest. It's, you know, it's everyone has to find their own way of dealing with work and family. And for me, um, it was important to be able to have my time with the boys, but also have my time at work. And it was working hours. I am at work. Even if, you know, the early days I didn't have an office or I was at home, um, but I would have someone um, take care of, of the boys while I was working and then evenings and weekends. And I always say there's three things in life. There is work, there's family and there's social life. And I feel at every single point you can only do two. So when I was young and single, I would have work and social life. When I got kids, uh, it was work and family. And then now that the kids are a bit older, I can have a bit more of a social life. So it's- Did you try and have all three and then think actually I could, two is the max? Um, I, I, I tried on the, the social aspect. I became very antisocial for a, a big chunk of time. It was work and family and that's it. And yeah. I, I feel I was at the point I didn't have any friends outside work. And, and I felt that after COVID and I thought, you know, I need to get back and I need to reconnect with my girlfriends. Yeah. Um, so, but, but it was what it was, was busy with the kids. And um, I feel that people understand your situation and they understand you're going through a phase, you're so busy. And then when you reemerge, then 
uh, hopefully, you know, you can reconnect. But there are sacrifices to be made when having work and family. And I don't feel there's any specific right way for anyone. I think yeah. it's what feels right for you, what compromises and priorities you have. And one way or another, you just make it work. And then it's over because the kids grow up. I mean, that's been my experience is you sort of get it right at times, but then it sort of goes wrong again because you haven't quite got the right childcare, the right balance. So then you pick it up and get it right again. Then it goes wrong again. And then the kids don't need quite the same childcare. And you think, oh, I got through it. Yeah. Amazingly, it worked. I actually am through it. And it wasn't too bad looking back. It was pretty good. A hundred percent. And I feel in order to manage work and family you have to delegate in both yeah you have to trust people to take care of your kids you also have to trust um uh, your team at work to take care of what needs to be taken care of when you are dealing with yes. family situations yeah. so delegation is key and it's a skill that you have to learn and yeah, everything is not going to be done your way when you delegate, but hopefully it's going to be done in a decent way that's acceptable. That still works, yeah. exactly. Okay, so we're now going to head uh, on a trip down memory lane and have a look at some of your memories. So Maria, your very first memory features a snake. Tell us more. Yes, so um, it was year five of running Rodial. Just got into our first office. I received the sample of the first anti-aging serum we were going to launch. Um, looking at the packaging, so I look at my team. I said, how are we going to launch this product and compete with all the mega brands without any budget, any advertising? Um, start looking at the list of ingredients and one of the ingredients related to Viper Venom. So I say to my team, why don't we call the product snake serum? And they're like, oh, we're going to go out of business. What are you talking about? But we were small. We didn't have anything to lose. So we all agreed. Let's just call the product snake serum. We capitalized. We made it all black. We did a photo shoot with snakes. We even had a snake charmer to make sure the snake behaved. <laughs> and we took some pictures. We sent out a press release, which is the old way of um, getting Marketing. something viral. Yeah. And suddenly it was picked up by every single newspaper in the world from Daily Mail to um, Australian press to Japan. And suddenly the phones wouldn't stop ringing and getting orders and sending pallets of products to Japan, to Germany, to Australia, opening new markets. So for me, that was the first moment that I thought, OK, we're onto something. Rodial can be a brand. And um, it, it just made me feel secure and it made me feel I was at the right place doing the right thing. But it was all about the product name and the positioning that changed it from one opportunity into another. Exactly. I, if we named the product Anti-Aging Serum, yeah. I don't know if it would be here now. Okay. Um, so taking that risk, it really took the business into a totally new journey. So for me, when I have entrepreneurs asking, what shall I do? Take a risk. Do something that's unexpected, that's unusual, that will make people remember you and your product. So our next photo is a scene that every woman will recognize, a radial counter. Yes. So this is our first counter in Selfridges here in London. And for me, going from that little shell from Phoenix into a big counter with our logo at the top and next to the likes of Esther Lauder and Tom Ford and Lancome, some of the established yeah. um, heritage brands, I felt really proud. And that was another moment of, oh my God, I feel we just about made it. I do think even though shopping's changed to some extent and we have, you know, the rise of some e-commerce and digital first startup brands, it's still quite tough to get one of these counters, isn't it? Like you still have to be a truly great brand to have an opportunity to be in Selfridges with a counter. Well, the thing with the counters is, first of all, it's the brand. You have to be a brand that brings a new customer into the store. It has a point of view. 
but also there is very tough uh, targets that you need to achieve. So every counter that is given to a brand comes with certain sales targets that you have to achieve. So it's not, oh, have the counter and... You've well, arrived. Yeah, you've <laughs> arrived. It's, that's the beginning of an even longer journey of making the counter successful. Um, but we've been, we've been around for 24 years. Yeah. We've built an amazing heritage brand and we do have a great team to be able to support it. And for me, yes, I mean, the online, but it's very different going to a store and having mm. a chat with, um, with your sales consultant and trying the products and getting the vibe. I mean, for me, yes, we lost it during COVID, but it's coming back in a big way. Yeah. yeah. So Maria, this looks like a very exciting photograph. Who is this and what is happening? So this is our first campaign that we did with Kylie Jenner. Uh, she did two campaigns with us for Nip and Fab, one in London, one in LA. And this was before she launched her own beauty range. And it was very early on on Instagram where celebrities weren't necessarily being paid to promote the brand. So um, we did two campaigns with her. She promoted Nip and Fab through a photo shoot and some other events and social media package that we did. And that was the single moment that she took Nip and Fab from being an unknown local brand to a global brand. Again, we're starting getting emails. What is this Nip and Fab brand? Where can I get it? Um, we opened all time in the US. Um, we opened Superdrug here in the UK and a lot of international stores. And for me, that was a moment in time that it was before the boom of celebrities having their own brands, before they were endorsing a new brand every day. And um, we were able to afford her. I, I don't think we would now. <laughs> uh, and it, it was a moment in time that it can never happen again. But I'm looking at it and I can't believe we did it. And do you feel that changed the trajectory for Nip and Fab? A hundred percent. And that was another risk because even though... Did it, it feel was, like a risk, like paying for her? She was still, they were still a big celebrity family at this point. It, you know, it is a risk because with a lot of the influence and the celebrities right now, you may spend a lot of money and it may go nowhere. Yeah. There's some, a little bit of brand awareness and then you spend all this money. So uh, it was tough. And also the other tough thing is with the whole Kardashians is they don't sign a contract um, up to 48 hours before the event. So we had it all booked. We spent a lot, a, a lot of deposits on photographers, events, people around to make this campaign happen. 48 hours before everything was going on, we didn't have a signature. So they could cancel any minute. And not only we would not do the campaign, but we would lose a lot of money. Yeah. So it was a risk, but we went with it and we're happy. So Maria, is this the book launch of How to Be an Overnight Success? Yes, this was the book launch event of my first book. And it's the moment that I can't believe I'm an author now. Because I, I'm not a full-time professional author. I'm yeah. a businesswoman first and foremost. And it just felt great to be able to share everything that I've went through with everyone who is wants to get inspired, wants to start their own business. It just was a very proud moment for me. And your last photo is a very important and current project of yours. Tell, tell us about this. So um, here I am on the set of Dragons Then Grease, uh, where I'm a dragon. Um, I filmed two seasons so far. We just finished filming season two. That's going to air in January. And um, when I was asked to be part of it, um, I, I was very intrigued. I've been watching the show both uh, in the UK and the US Shark Tank, and I've been a big fan over the years. And suddenly being in the set and being one of the dragons, it was unbelievable. But I got so much energy out of uh, meeting a lot of young up and coming entrepreneurs, hearing about all the different business ideas. And what really drives me is what I'm currently missing right now from, from my, my day to day job. Um, it takes me back to the first days when I was a startup which were one of the happiest days and, and most exciting days. Every small success was a big deal. Uh, and I do like to live these first days again through other companies and other entrepreneurs and be able to help them and mentor them in the journey. So it's been an amazing project. 
and we're already um, talking about season three. So yeah, and you've made excited. investments, haven't you? So you are involved now in supporting a number of businesses, although they're all in Greece, aren't they? Yes, they're all in Greece, yeah. uh, which is also something I really wanted to do because that's where I started and yeah. um, sort of giving back to the country who you know where I was born um, and I, I've, I've been very very um, excited about the quality of businesses that I've seen but you never know I, I may end up doing it in the UK as well there's there's a lot of great entrepreneurs I uh, come across throughout the year so you never know maybe there's a UK leg to be coming up next and I think as well what's interesting is they're not all beauty businesses are they that you're investing in or you're getting involved with by Dragon's Den how has that been for you to evolve all the knowledge you've built up over 24 years and then see how you can apply it to different industries different businesses and different niches um, so just because I'm so deep in the beauty industry and it's my day to day, when I was called to be on Dragons then, I immediately thought what type of companies I would be investing in. And for me, I just want to start a new story with a brand that's outside the beauty business uh, where I will be contributing to the business success, but I also like to learn learn about new industries and apply some of the business principles that I've learned, apply them in a different industry and that makes it fresh and exciting for yeah. me. Great. And before we wrap up, just what's your final piece of, of advice for our viewers, many of whom are women wanting to start businesses or with businesses, hoping they can be as successful as you are? Uh, my advice is make a start now. I feel a lot of people procrastinate and wanting to have the idea perfected, the right team, the right funding. Um, and I feel a lot of great ideas just never take off because the entrepreneur is waiting for that perfect moment. For me, just make a start, bring energy into your project and action brings more action. Uh, you end up learning uh, but unless you start, you can never succeed. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Maria. It's been so wonderful talking to you today. Thank you. Thank you for having me.